Now, how do we transform the way humans treat the natural world and make our economic system fit for purpose? To look at the science and economics behind our debate today, I'm delighted now to bring in Dr. Johan Rockström, Director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, Sir Partha Dasgupta of the University of Cambridge, and Hans Brunich, the European Environment Agency's Executive Directory. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us. My first question will be to Dr. Rockström. Now we know that our planet is already reaching tipping point. How does this threaten the 1.5 goal? And why must climate and nature be seen as one, Dr. Rockström? We have, you know, just over the last five years made such significant advancements in our understanding that the climate system is on Earth, to a large extent, regulated not only by our fossil fuel burning, but also by biosphere systems that help us in absorbing and dampening the disturbance caused by our fossil fuel burning. So you have the Amazon rainforest, the oceans, the ice sheets, the permafrost, the grasslands, the wetlands, absorbing and dampening and cooling. So we have more and more scientific support that the only way to hold the 1.5 degrees Celsius line to keep global warming well below 2 and land at 1.5 requires not only to phase out fossil fuels and reach a net zero world economy by 2050 in only you know, less than 30 years time, but we also need to become you know, really sustainable stewards of all the ecosystems on Earth because they help us in, in holding carbon, in absorbing carbon and cooling the planet. So it's truly a sustainability transition that we face so urgently. A question now for um, Sir Dasgupta on really what is at stake now and how extreme the risks are posed by the decline in biodiversity. As uh, Dr. Rockstrom has just pointed out, uh, the demand we are making on the biosphere's goods and services vastly exceeds the biosphere's capacity to supply them on a sustainable basis, okay? Some crude calculations suggest that the ratio is about 1.6, which is which we, we get the metaphor that we need 1.6 Earths to satisfy our needs. Now, that's not going to happen. There aren't 1.6 Earths. So we have to either decrease demand or help to rejuvenate the biosphere by create, allowing it to supply more because we have trashed the biosphere enormously, all the ecosystems that Dr. Rockstrom has just pointed out to. Okay, And most important, before I conclude, one shouldn't think that the tipping points are just lying in the future, which is very often the criticism that we environmental scientists face from those who think we are overreaching our worries. Local communities have faced exhaustion of their local resources. Otherwise, you can't explain these uh, distress migration that takes place from one region to another and where they're not welcome because the people who are trying to be hosts are also very poor. So this has happened. OK, well, let's get the view from Brussels and bring, it, bring in uh, Mr. Hans Brunich and ask you, what actions when it comes to nature do Europeans need to prioritise? Well, I think in uh, the last two years, Europe, Europe has put forward a really important package of uh, priorities in addressing these issues. Huh? The European Green Deal brings together a lot of the elements that were referred to uh, by, by the colleagues Rockström and Dasgupta in the European Green Deal, where indeed one makes the connection uh, between biodiversity, between climate change and resource use, and also looks, I would say, at, at the fundamental underpinnings of going to a sustainable system, and that is addressing the key economic drivers of unsustainability, the energy system, the food system, the mobility system, the built environment. So by addressing the fundamental unsustainability of these systems, uh, I think we, we are uh, at least uh, you know, carving out the pathways, the trajectories that are needed. So the priorities are out there. I think the difficulty is now translating this in uh, what I would call bending the trend dynamics, because the trends over the last 40, 50 years in all of these issues have been negative and it's not enough to slow them down. We now really need to bend the trends and that will require deep transitions in the core systems of the European and the global economy. Okay, and Dr. Rockstrom, what would a nature positive economic model look like for people? How would it differ from today's? 
Well, I think um, Partha Dasgupta's report recently on the economics of biodiversity has, has to a large extent the answers to that question. I mean, putting value on natural asset, having strong sustainability, which means that the economy must now develop within scientifically defined planetary boundaries or guardrails, whatever you want to call them, there are there is a fence beyond which we take risks of irreversible changes, but within which we can have equity and prosperity. And I think this is a, a shift in the economic system. So it doesn't, in my mind at least, necessarily mean that we throw the economic system overboard, but we have to domesticate it, so to say. We have to keep it within finite bounds and put the right value on nature so that we become more efficient. And, and as Partha points out, release the demand of unsustainable overuse of natural resources and the functioning of ecosystems. Okay, but the value on nature. And Sir Dasgupta, pricing the living world is suggested by mainstream economics to correct externalities. But do you think that's enough for nature to fully recover by 2050? No, because there's the other side of it also, which is that the nature requires a lot of investment. And bear in mind that investing in nature does not mean lots of machinery. It means leaving parts of nature alone, let her recover. We really need to reorganize our notion of what constitutes economic success. It should not be seen as GDP because it's highly misleading. We really ought to be doing an inventory of assets, which includes Mother Nature. Mm. So in my review, I suggest, and not suggest, we show that the right index is something like the inclusive wealth of nations. So each year, a nation ought to work estimate the wealth it owns, has access to. Not just produced capital, not just human capital, but natural capital as well. But Hans, I guess my question for you, if you could be brief, please. What hope do we have of agreeing ways to factor in externalities when global policymakers can't even tax carbon? Well, I, I think that's where the fundamental rethinking needs to take place. And right now we are still thinking uh, mostly in terms of GDP is the, the sort of ultimate tape measure. The economy can draw on the resources of society and creates a lot of inequality on top of that. And it can then almost for free use uh, natural capital. So this fundamental rethinking and embedding that in governance practices, in economic pricing mechanisms, in tax approaches, in ownership approaches, in producer responsibility, all of those elements you can bring together. There is a ton of research and a ton of knowledge on that, but it all starts with the fundamental reconfiguration of the starting point. And that has to be that natural capital is the foundational and ultimately the enabling capital for a vibrant society on a planetary scale. Do you think people will have to just get used to a more limited way of life for the sake of a healthier planet? What Hans describes here requires definitely a kind of a shift towards not only inclusive wealth for policy, but also um, a recognition what is value of life for all citizens on Earth. At the same time, I think Partha has a key point here, that if you start charging and putting value on natural assets, you can have social dividends to give some kind of soft buffer and kind of soft landing for those communities in the world that will be having uh, the, the toughest transition from our current unsustainable world towards the sustainable landing. So I think you mm -hmm. have to be recognizing also that we're in a very turbulent phase of, of transition. Okay, Mr. Brunich, you wanted to make a point? Come in. Yes, I, I think it's really important as well to, to focus on inequality. I cannot be convinced that the current inequality on this planet between countries, within countries, can be a fertile ground for fundamental sustainability. So addressing the social dimension, the distributional aspects, I think will be an absolutely uh, fundamental precondition to put us on that trajectory. The point about inequality is extremely deep poverty is connected with environmental degradation because it's not a, not a coincidence that the world's poorest countries are in the tropics and also the, the richest biodiversity is also in the tropics. The two coincide. If we pay for it, they will enjoy the benefits, the poor, the real poor. I want to ask you about the payments that you promoted to nations for protecting ecosystems. Can the approach, for example, in Gabon, charging rents for their natural assets be scaled globally, do you think? Well, this is becoming, it's like paying for what you're consuming. 
we've been free riding, all right? Pretty much all rich societies have been doing that. So yes, pricing is extremely important. And the institutional changes that are required in order to be able to establish these prices, and now payment for ecosystem services is just one. And it's happening internally within countries, of course. It's happening in Costa Rica, the UK, China, and elsewhere. But we do need to have payments for ecosystem services at the international level, like the global commons. Uh, and payment for countries which house the global commons, uh, the global public goods like the, the tropical rainforest, because they house the, those few countries house these enormous capital assets, but the benefits of which we're all enjoying. And Dr. Rockstrom, with COVID, for example, with the pandemic, we've seen that politics can react boldly to crises when they want. So thinking outside the box, what policies would bring us in line with our planet's boundaries? It's so good that you connect this, this dialogue to, to the COVID crisis because, you know, we are in the midst of a climate crisis, we're in the midst of an ecological crisis, and we're putting, you know, the, the livability on Earth for all future generations at risk. I would like us to, uh, to look at the COVID crisis and act, you know, at least, but preferably a factor 10, more actively to, to solve the climate crisis. And a final question for the three of you. I mean, 2030 is around the corner and we can't change our system of resource extractive capitalism in just eight years. But are you optimistic that companies and markets can find the answers? We start with um, Sir Dasgupta. It's a, this is a hard one to predict. I don't know enough about the business uh, the sector, but I've had about a hundred or so events since my review was uh, launched with the private sector. And albeit it was a self-selected group, their self-selection at work, but there's no question. They're extremely well informed. They're extremely concerned about the, their bottom line, by the way. And Dr. Ruckstrom, same question to you about companies and markets. Well, let me start with the negative side, which is that uh, I'm deeply concerned because we're running out of time. We're running out of time because we're bumping towards the edge of the, <laughs> the resilient capacity of both the climate system and the biosphere. So in that sense, uh, it's, it's really worrying whether we'll be able to kind of have a safe landing in time. On the other side, something very special has happened over just the last five years. We've turned a corner where the whole sustainability agenda is moving rapidly from climate to all the planetary boundaries and also becoming much more central to the boardrooms and the CEO level of companies. It's no longer just uh, a corporate social responsibility agenda, it's rather a strategy to be competitive, to be successful, to be able to move and develop into the future of, uh, of the next phase of modern development in the world. Just briefly then, Hans Brunich, um, your final thoughts there? I would say, yes, of course, the private sector will have to play a critical role, but it will have to be credible, transparent and accountable. And I think that's where, uh, for example, the Sustainable Finance Initiative in, in Europe can play a role, but also where the CDP can play a role uh, in, in driving uh, business towards that change, but in a credible, transparent and accountable manner. One final point, which is conversations on these problems very often revert to climate change. And it can mislead us because there is a sense in which there is a technological fix that's possible, namely move to clean energy, uh, clean energy being non-fossil fuels, okay? Now, the trouble is that this is not going to work for biodiversity loss. We really need institutional changes which price the objects so that we have to pay for it, in other words, to cushion the demand we make. So that's one. And the final point related to this is this, that we also tend to think that it's the government's problem, that they ought to be doing it. Of course, they must be involved. Who is that saying? That's transparent. But we citizens need to act in concert because it's a global problem we all face. All right. And with the prices rising for these goods, if we can make them, we can charge for them, then the direction of technological change, which will be take, undertaken not by governments, but the private sector, will change. It will be nature saving technological device, not labor saving technological device. And that should usher in a new era. And it's entirely possible that our great grandchildren will have a better life than we do, by the way. This is not a story of only pessimism here. That brings us to an end. Thank you so much, Hans Brunich, Sir Partha Dasgupta, 
and Dr. Johan Rockstrom, thank you so much for your time and very insightful um, contributions. Thank you so much.